So back in the day, <laughs> yeah, in the 1980s and 90s, yeah, decades ago, I know, uh, when I was in high school and college, I worked in the hospitality industry as a busboy, as a server, as a bartender, and as a manager. You might not know, about a decade I did that. I started out in my hometown of St. Louis, and then when I moved to Boston to pursue my dream of becoming a professional rock drummer, I continued to work in restaurants there. I worked in the Spaghetti Factory, the big one in downtown St. Louis, uh, the Olive Garden, a place called the Dub Club. It's a real place. It, it's, uh, it was live reggae, it was really fun. And that's just to name a few. Uh, but one of the experiences that impacted me the most was the time I spent, this is an actual picture of the restaurant, at the Sunset Grill and Tap. Now for three years, I spent the majority of my waking hours standing behind this bar. It's the next photo in the slide there. There we go. You see all those bottles of beer on the wall? We had, you know, if you were going to sing that song, it would take you a long time to sing. We had 500 different styles of beer from all over the world, and we had 100 different beers on tap. It was a pretty fun place. We had a wait every night. It was a very popular place in Boston, and I made some good money there, and I also made some great friends, people I still stay in touch with today. And I really think everybody would benefit from working in the hospitality industry for a while. You know, I learned a lot about human nature by serving in restaurants. Waiting on people, for me, was a formative experience in how I see the world and how I see people. And I see a lot of connections between church and restaurants. Um, they both are in the, the uh, business of serving people's needs, while restaurants are serving our bodies, churches are serving our spirits. Um, but there's a lot of overlap, a lot of ways uh, that I see some wisdom and insights that we can use in our daily lives. And that's what I'm going to explore with you during this sermon series. Today's the first in the series, and I've got lots and lots of great stories to share with you. So with that, I want to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray for God's blessing. Almighty God, as we receive your holy word today, may our minds be open to learn, our hearts willing to change, and our hands ready to serve. Amen. It's all about the money. Tips, right? Waiting on people is hard work, but at the end of the night, you have a fistful of cash. Makes it all worthwhile. When I started out as a server, I would spend a lot of energy trying to predict how well people were going to tip me, and I would adjust my service to that table according to my predictions. So. I had stereotypes about my customers, certain generalizations about who were the good tippers and who weren't. Now, I'm not proud of this. I'm, what I'm going to tell you is the truth. I'm being real with you, uh, but this is a sermon series about human nature. It's about, uh, for me, this is a confession of my prejudice, okay? But in, in my mind, the people who were dressed nicely and looked like they had money were going to tip better than the people who were dressed sloppy. I assumed that people who were friendly and kind to me while I was waiting on them were going to tip me better than the people who were mean and demanding. I assumed that middle-aged people were going to tip, tip me better than college kids or maybe seniors who were on a fixed income, right? In my experience, whites tip better than minorities and smokers tip better than non-smokers. You might, now see, that doesn't matter now because you can't smoke in a restaurant. But at this time, way back in the day, when I was young, uh, those were my assumptions. And so when a party would be sat at a table in my station, I would be excited if it was a group of middle-aged white men in suits who smoked. Like, yes! I have hit a home run. And so I would lavish them with good service and then I'd get a big tip. Interesting, huh? But if somebody was sat in my uh, station who I assumed would not tip well, then I just gave them, you know, the bare minimum service and I didn't get a great tip. It's really a self-fulfilling prophecy, though, isn't it? Yeah. The more experience I gained, the more years I worked in the hospitality industry, the more people surprised me. Right? Customers didn't always fulfill my stereotypes. They defied the generalizations that I tried to put on them. For example, I'd have some young customers, some college kids, they'd just be a pain all night long. They weren't dressed very well. And I'd be like, this is just not worth it. They're not going to tip me. And then they'd give me a huge tip. What do I do with that? 
Or I'd have some people who were dressed really nicely. They had their bags. They were just out shopping. They were very friendly the whole night. And then they leave me like nothing. I had a table leave me one cent one time. I chased him down the street. I was so mad. It's true. I almost got fired for that, but I did. <laughs> um, like you're not supposed to yell at your customers, but uh, anyway. Or I'd have a table where the people were really difficult, right? They were really demanding all night long. They, they seemed like they were unhappy about everything, the food, the service, nothing would, was good enough for them. And so I think, boy, they're just, they're going to leave me a terrible tip because they're so unhappy. And then they leave me a huge tip and say, you really did a great job of meeting our needs. And so I started to realize there was no way for me to predict how people were going to tip me. And it was a waste of my energy to try to prejudge people based on appearance. So my new strategy became to treat everyone the same, to give them, to the best of my ability, to give them the best service I could, regardless of their appearance, their gender, their race, their age, their personality, did not matter. And what's really cool is once I started doing that, I started making a lot of money. Right, when you're doing the right thing, it's funny how you get blessed. So treating all people the same, right, with respect and with kindness, that is grace. That is what grace is. Grace believes everyone is valuable. Grace brings people together. Grace builds relationships. And grace is what Paul is talking about here in Romans when he's talking to the early church and he's telling them, let love be genuine among you, right? Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And extend hospitality to strangers, right? Hospitality industry. And then he goes on to say, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Be, do not be hardy, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You know, Paul offers us this beautiful description of what life can be like in a grace-filled community, uh, an idealized uh, way of living with one another. But the reality is, is that's not the world we live in, is it? In our, in our workplaces or at church or with our families, relationships are broken. There's tension. There's, there's difficulties. And so then the question is, what do we do with that? What do we do with mean people? What do we do with people who attack us and who threaten us and who hurt us? Paul actually goes on to describe what to do. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So it's the Lord's job to judge. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What a powerful image, this idea of heaping burning coals on our enemies' heads. How exactly does that work? You know, th that image makes me think of, uh, my mom told me this story. My mom was a waitress back in the day, not, not a server. Today we're called servers. Back in the 1960s, she was a waitress at Howard Johnson's. Do you remember Howard Johnson's? Yeah. And she has this great story. She said one day uh, a radio DJ came in. You know, radio DJs were a big deal in the 60s. They were, you know, famous. They were personalities. And this guy thought he was hot stuff. And he was sitting in my mom's station, and he was really being arrogant and sexist and giving her a hard time. And she said that she uh, accidentally poured a bowl of hot soup on his lap and kind of put him in his place, right? I think she might have gotten fired for that, if I remember how the story goes. But I don't think that's exactly what Paul had in mind when he's talking about pouring heap, heaps of burning coals on our enemies' heads. Uh, what I think he's saying, I think Paul is saying, kill them with kindness, right? So when they're being mean to us, respond to them with kindness. 
Now you might be wondering, how is being nice to someone who's being mean, how is that like putting burning coals on their head? How does that hurt them? But if you think about it, when you refuse to react, when you resist that temptation to get revenge, when you remain calm and patient, it actually drives your enemies crazy, right? Because they're hoping you'll respond. They want you to be mean back so that they can be justified in hating you. See, you deserve my contempt. See how you're acting? I've had that happen to me. It was very confusing where you react to somebody and then they go, see, that's, that's why you deserve to be mistreated. Our enemies no longer see us as people anymore, right? They, they don't see us for who we really are. We become this object of hate. And that's evil. In my experience, that is the definition of evil. Evil dehumanizes others. Evil divides people against each other. Evil destroys relationships. And Paul warned us about surrendering to the ways of the world. He said, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's what spiritual leaders do. And we desperately need more spiritual leaders. People who will rise above all the pettiness and the politics and the paybacks. Spiritual leaders who will help build grace-filled community by following the example of Jesus Christ who welcomed everyone, right, who served everyone, no matter who they were, without prejudice. Evil can be overcome by love. Evil can be overcome by love. And we know this as followers of the risen Christ. We know this is true. Jesus took on to himself on the cross. He took on the evil and the hatred and the lies and the sin. He took all that on and he died. But that wasn't the end of the story. Then he rose again from the dead into new life. Evil did not get the last word. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. Amen.